Okay, so <coughs> summary, you can't rely on a transaction to abort. It's good to know why they might abort. So as we've discussed, one reason the transaction might abort is if your transaction is too big. It could be the case that uh, you filled up your cash. Uh, it could be worse. Uh, it could be that you have a complicated cash data structure and you fill up one corner of it. Anytime you would have to evict a piece of a dirty data, then your uh, transaction will, will abort. Your transaction might also abort because it's too slow. It runs for too long. The processor has timer interrupts. When a timer interrupt happens, the processor cleans out all the caches. And that will also abort your uh, transaction. Uh, your transaction might abort for any reason whatsoever. You know, it might uh, abort uh, because you ex executed an illegal instruction. You made a system call that uh, you're not allowed to make. Uh, it could be that um, you know, Intel decided for some reason not to commit your transaction. And there's nothing uh, you can do about that. So one way to fix this is to integrate hardware and software. So this is often called hybrid transactional memory because it uh, combines both hardware and uh, software approaches. And <clears throat> there's a large variety of hybrid uh, proposals for hybrid transactional memory uh, systems. I'm going to cover um, two or three of the most um, uh, common, uh, common ones. So um, the most simple thing, the simplest thing you can do is a non-speculative fallback. So here, if I try something and it fails as a hardware transaction, then I'm going to say, well, that's enough speculation. I'm just going to do it the old-fashioned way with a lock. And so the idea here is <clears throat> I have a problem that I'm running my speculative transaction concurrently with other threads that might be using locks. And I need to be sure that everything works uh, correctly. So the first thing that I'm going to do when I start this is I'm going to read the lock state. So I'm not going to lock the lock. I'm just going to read the bit to see whether the lock is uh, being held. Uh, this has a subtle side effect, which means that once I read the uh, lock bit, if anybody changes it, that will abort my transaction because somebody has written to some data that I've read. So by uh, reading the lock bit, I basically said, you know, abort my transaction if anybody tries to uh, acquire this lock. Now, there's also another danger <coughs> that I read the uh, lock bit and somebody else already has it locked. This won't abort my transaction because it, it was uh, written non-speculatively, not by another transaction. So when I, read the, when I read the lock bit, I say, in the future, let me know if anybody locks it. Meantime, I've got to check and make sure that nobody locked it in the past. So if that happens, then I can do the work. Now, if I abort my transaction, in other words, if either the transaction aborts or I discover that the uh, lock is already held, then I say, well, there's no point in trying to do this speculatively. I'm going to take the slow path, and I'm just going to lock the data structure or whatever the other uh, alternative uh, path is. But the basic idea is that I can um, leave a, a tripwire saying that if anybody tries to do things non-speculatively, I'm going to um, um, do the same. So in an ideal execution where there's no synchronization conflicts, everybody executes hardware transactions and is all very fast. If, there, if one thread is unsuccessful, at executing hardware transactions, then it flips over and acquires locks. And once it starts acquiring locks, it's going to abort speculative transactions, and then everybody will flip over to using locks until the contention dies down, and then the threads will go back to using uh, speculative uh, hardware transactions. <coughs> now, Intel has a built-in support for this. Uh, uh, they do something called uh, lock elision. And what you can do is Intel knows which instructions are used to acquire locks. You can put a prefix operation in front of that, uh, which in older Intel architectures is viewed as a no-op. It has no effect. 
but it says that if you have hardware support for transactions, then execute this as a transaction once. So the first time you do this, you do what I showed you on the previous slide. The hardware reads the lock and then executes the um, code speculatively. Now the nice thing about this is you don't need to change your code. You can take old code that uses locks and take a binary editor and add this prefix in front of each uh, lock and unlock instruction. And this is a way of retrofitting transactions to old uh, code. So the first time around, you read the lock and execute speculatively. If the speculation fails, then uh, you will say, okay, that's, that's enough uh, speculation. I, I'm just going <coughs> to acquire, go back, restore the world to its previous state and acquire the lock and uh, pretend uh, that this speculation never happened. Now, um, why is this a good idea? Well, if you have conventional locks, obviously they serialize activities. They make sure that things happen in a one at a time order. Now, it's often the case that programs acquire locks in a conservative uh, way. So you don't really know if there is a synchronization conflict inside the critical section, but it would be a disaster if there were a conflict, so you have to acquire the lock preventatively. But with a lock elision, in the usual case where there is no actual conflict, then you can execute your uh, critical sections in parallel. So again, the principle behind speculation is that most of the time there is no conflict. If most of the time there is a conflict, then you should not do speculation. But uh, many uh, kinds of uh, parallel software <coughs> have the property that it's very unlikely that there's a synchronization conflict, but it's possible. And if there is a conflict and there is no synchronization, then you will get wrong answers. Uh, but uh, most of the time, you're, uh, you'll, you'll be okay executing these things uh, uh, concurrently. So now I'm going to talk about a, another form of hybrid uh, transactional memory, which we'll call locker teleportation. Now, sometimes uh, people act as if uh, locks and transactions were somehow opposed to each other. You know, I may have created this impression in the first part of the talk. But uh, there are a lot of interesting applications where you can combine locks and transactions together and get something that, is, that you can't do with either of these mechanisms uh, separately. And so lock teleportation is an, a good example of how you can make uh, locks much more flexible and, and, and efficient uh, by combining uh, locking disciplines with uh, transactions. So one way, common way of uh, designing concurrent data structures is something called hand-over-hand um, -hand, uh, locking or lock uh, coupling, it's sometimes called. And here the idea is I have, find, I have a lock on every list element. <coughs> and as I go through the uh, list, kind of like a, a child on a playground, you know, I acquire one lock, I hold on to this lock and I acquire the next one, and then you know, I release the first one and, and then acquire the second one. So you're always holding at least one lock, but you, you release the older lock, acquire the new one, release this lock, and acquire the next one. And uh, this allows a certain level of parallelism, uh, say, on list operations. So for example, here, uh, <coughs> here's an example of a thread that wants to remove item B using hand-over-hand -hand locking. So it goes along until it uh, discovers the uh, node with B. Then it uh, swings the pointer around and releases the locks. And, uh, the, and it's done. This gives you a kind of pipelining parallelism because multiple threads can traverse the list at the same time. It's not actually all that good because threads can't overtake each other. If one thread falls asleep, then all of the other threads are going to back up uh, behind it. So it has many of the problems of locking, but it gives you a little bit more concurrency than having a single uh, lock would have. But we can combine this kind of uh, locking discipline with uh, transactions to get a much more powerful uh, structure. <coughs> so here, we call this lock teleportation. So here, 
the thread has a lock on the very first element of the list. And now it starts up a hardware transaction. And the hardware transaction reads through the list. Now, you remember that uh, transactions are serializable, so from the point of view of the thread executing the transaction, it's alone in the world. There's no concurrent updates. It's as if everything, it's, it's like one of these uh, Marvel uh, superhero movies where everyone freezes and the superhero uh, you know, runs through the uh, crowd. So the uh, thread goes through the uh, data structure. It goes to the end of the data structure. It releases one lock and acquires another lock by setting bits. And from the outside, it looks like the thread was holding a lock over here and suddenly it's holding a lock over here and you didn't see anything happen in the middle. So it's a way of uh, kind of a discontinuous quantum uh, jump where a lock can move from one part of a data structure to the other instantaneously using the hardware transaction to um, uh, go from one uh, uh, place to another. And uh, this is uh, efficient because there's no locks acquired in the middle. Acquiring and releasing a lock is expensive because you have to do typically a compare and swap instruction, which is uh, slow and uh, bad uh, for, for your uh, cache um, uh, locality. <coughs> and so there's a question here, uh, how far should you teleport? So I'm holding a lock here. I'm going to launch a hardware transaction that reads through the list. Uh, at some point, I'm going to stop and uh, transfer the lock. Uh, if I if I'm too timid and I don't go far enough, then I missed an opportunity to uh, save um, a computation. If I go too far, then I will fill up my cache and my transaction will abort and I will have wasted uh, my uh, efforts. So it's a little bit of a uh, gamble. I have to, how do I know what, what is the right distance to go? Uh, typically what I want to do is I want to go until just before I fill up my cache, then I'm going to stop. Uh, a little bit too soon, uh, that's probably okay. A little bit too far uh, is no good because uh, I've just wasted uh, lots of resources. So uh, there are many different strategies you could use, but a, a kind of a uh, reasonable one is to say, <coughs> if I succeed, if my transaction commits, then I'm going to increment the limit just a little bit. So if, if I commit, then I'm going to say next time, if I go eight hops and I succeed, then next time I'm going to do nine. So I'm going to be, going to be a little bit greedy. However, if my transaction aborts, then uh, what happened? Well, maybe I was too greedy. Maybe I filled up the cache. Maybe there was contention. Maybe there was another thread that's interfering. So now I'm going to be cautious and I'm going to do a cut my uh, distance down by one half. So I'm going to grow slowly and uh, retreat uh, quickly. And this is, uh, this is a common uh, pattern in uh, you know, network protocols. So uh, what does this code uh, look like? Well, this is uh, C code, uh, which is uh, basically almost the same as the uh, real, uh, real code. So <coughs> the, this is the code that that uh, moves the lock from one place to another. This, uh, we don't insert or delete nodes or do any of the work uh, uh, here. This is simply a way of moving the lock instantaneously from one place to another one. So we start out with a pointer to a lock node. And this being a list, we, this is the value that we are searching for. So what I'm saying is I'm searching for this value V uh, please move the lock closer to V. If you find V, then lock uh, that node. If you don't find V, then at least uh, uh, go somewhere closer. And return a lock node with a value which is still less than or equal to V. And so, so this is uh, useful uh, for adding, removing uh, all kinds of uh, things. <coughs> uh, how many times do we retry? Well, I'm going to set some uh, limit. So I'm going to try this 32 times. And if it doesn't work after 32 times, then I'm going to give up. Now, this is the pattern uh, that uh, we saw before. So I'm going to call xbegin. If xbegin returns the 
active transaction code, then, you know, that's great. I'm now going to do, uh, do my work. So I'm going to traverse up to a fixed limit of nodes. So I have some idea that it's safe to traverse a certain number of nodes. I'm going to go that far. Then I'm going to move the lock from the beginning to the end. And then I'm going to do uh, X end, which means try to commit. The important idea, the, the important concept here is the teleport the limit, which is the distance that I'm going to go. And this is the, this will control, uh, you know, if teleport limit is large, then the gamble is that I can uh, move the lock a large distance and save a lot of uh, work. If it's too large, then my transaction will abort and I will have wasted the time and electricity. So here I'm going to, when I traverse, I'm going to stop if either I find the node or I've uh, gone far enough. <coughs> then um, at that point, I'm going to move the lock. Moving the lock says tr change the bit to zero where I started, set the bit to one where I, uh, where I stopped. Now you don't need to use a compare and swap the way you would normally with a lock because you're inside a transaction. In fact, you can't use a compare and swap because that's an illegal instruction inside a transaction. But uh, it, it is a, a way of sort of simulating a, uh, a much more expensive computation where you lock, unlock, lock, unlock by instantaneously jumping from one state to another uh, state. Uh, then when, you get to, when you're done, you try to commit the transaction and either you succeed or you go back and re-execute xbegin and return with a different code. If you commit, uh, then, uh, as I said, you increment your teleport limit by one. Because next time I'm going to, I'm going to be more, I'm going to be a little bit greedy, and I'm going to push the uh, window a little bit uh, further. And <clears throat> and then I'm going to return uh, the node uh, that uh, that I locked on the on the last step. Yes. Is it safe? It's safe to do do what? I'm sorry. Oh yes, yes. Uh, the question is: Is it uh, safe to move the locks outside the transaction? Uh, no, it's not safe because. Is it safe to to, to read, or read the bits outside the transaction? Um, it may be, I think it's safe to read the bits outside the transaction, but uh, if you write the bits outside the transaction, then you'll abort. Uh, it, it's, <coughs> it, it would not be safe, well, it would be safe, but a bad idea to say increment, teleport, limit inside the transaction. Oh, uh, about the lock. So, so the discipline we have here is you can read and write the lock inside a transaction. If, if you're outside the transaction, you can do a compare and swap to acquire and release the, uh, a compare and swap and a write. And, and, and that's safe, yeah. Because if you read the lock inside the transaction and somebody tries to acquire it, that will abort your transaction. So the, uh, there's an asymmetry in that non-transactional code cannot see transactions, but transactional code is aborted by transactions. And one thing that uh, would be very helpful to have would be some way of having a transaction sort of signal to the outside world, you know, don't acquire this lock right now because I'm running a transaction, please just wait. But there's no way to do that uh, currently. Uh, the cost is the cost is about the same. The difference is that compare and swap is guaranteed to, to succeed, but if your transaction always aborts for some reason, oh, but but if the transaction aborts, then you know nothing about the state of the lock. But a compare and swap can come back and say, oh, uh, you can't have this lock. Someone someone else has it. 
Yeah, so, so, so the compare and swap can check the state of the lock, but a transaction might not succeed in giving you any information if it aborts. Ah, but, but um, I suppose in principle that might work, but I think that would be dangerous because you don't, Intel is not entirely clear on when you get conflict. Uh, you know, it could be that something on a different, something on the, uh, an unrelated piece of data on the same cache line was uh, modified. And that would, that would be a conflict. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the lock, and, and you would have to make sure that the lock is cache aligned and so on, and then next time you, you set an optimization flag, it would move it around. So I think that would be a dangerous way to, uh, to program. So, um, so the else here is if you do the xbegin and you get back an abort code, then uh, you cut your teleportation limit in half. I mean, in practice, you might want to look at it and say, well, I aborted uh, for some uh, uh, reason, you know, that for, for some other reason, but I'm just going to assume here that you aborted because you filled up your cache. And then in that case, we'll, we'll cut the uh, teleportation limit in half and, and try again. So, um, you know, th this, it turns out that this uh, works uh, fairly uh, well when you um, uh, run experiments. Uh, typically on a uh, four core uh, machine, uh, teleportation limits are a few thousand uh, nodes. And, uh, <coughs> You know, it's a, um, it works well for lists. It doesn't work quite as well for things like skip lists because there's a lot of contention at higher levels. But uh, that's the subject of a different, um, different paper. So now uh, what I'm going to talk about are software transactional memory. So software transactional memory is something where we're going to assume that you don't have hardware. So Hybrid transactional memory, you rely on a uh, hardware transaction as a kind of speed up mechanism, and you have software around it like the seatbelt or an airbag on a car. So if the hardware doesn't work, you fall back to the software. So now I'm going to talk about what you would do if you wanted to build a software transactional memory system entirely out of software without hardware assist. Now, there is, um, there's probably a hundred papers that have been published on how to do software transactional memory. Uh, I'm going to describe some very simple uh, schemes. Uh, I'm going to try to point out where interesting issues are and where some of the performance problems are and where some of the semantic problems are. But I don't really have uh, time to go over all of the uh, various uh, subtleties. So what I'm going to present here is somewhat simplistic, uh, but it, I think it, it illustrates <coughs> most of the important issues. So software the early software transactional memory systems were uh, basically lock-free. So you, you would use compare and swap to uh, make things uh, happen. Uh, later, <coughs> transactional memory systems are based on uh, locks. Uh, these tended to be a little, somewhat more efficient than the uh, lock-free uh, schemes. Uh, you might say, well, but didn't you just spend the first part of the lock talk explaining why uh, locks are a bad idea? And uh, the answer is, um, for applications, uh, everything I said about locks are true. But for people, elite programmers who are writing runtime systems, they can do anything they want. You know, we don't care. All we want is a nice abstraction <coughs> that uh, works efficiently and does uh, and behaves uh, correctly. So uh, we're going to say it's okay to use uh, locks in the internals of the uh, software transaction memory system as long as the uh, programmers who use it don't need to know about it. Because maybe someday we can replace those locks with hardware transactions or, or something else. So for lock-based SDMs um, tend to have a few things in common. The, um, many of the techniques are similar to um, uh, techniques used by databases. Uh, one important difference is that in databases, everything lives on a disk. 
And the wonderful thing about disks is that they're really slow. And this means that anything that you do in memory doesn't really matter because you're waiting for the disk anyway. Now, software transactional memory, uh, we don't make any guarantees about um, surviving crashes, so we can't hide behind a disk. We, every uh, sin that uh, we commit in software transactional memory is visible because it makes things slower. If, it takes, if your disk uh, takes uh, 10 milliseconds to do something, then uh, who cares how many microseconds your data structures take. But if there's no disk, then every microsecond your um, uh, uh, STM data structures uh, take, uh, it becomes quite visible. So <coughs> basically what we're going to do is we're going to keep track of a read set, which are all the locations and values that, uh, that were read by your uh, transaction. And we're going to keep track of the write set, which is everything that you wrote. And then uh, the um, scheme I'm going to describe here, the changes are installed at commit. There's another way to do things where you update things in place. And if your transaction aborts, you go and you undo things. That's also a, a way of um, designing these systems. But that, that is typically somewhat more complicated for reasons that I'll explain uh, later. So here I'm going to assume that you accumulate all your changes on the side, and then uh, when you commit the transaction, you apply them all at once. <coughs> and when you're detecting synchronization conflicts, you can do this eagerly as the um, transaction uh, runs, or you can postpone and just uh, uh, check for conflicts as you commit. And I'm going to describe something that is mostly lazy in the sense that you discover uh, synchronization conflicts at commit time, although I'm going to sneak in a few uh, runtime uh, checks uh, as, as optimizations. So here is a, a very simple system. So I'm going to um, think of things as um, a C program meaning that I'm going to be dealing with just unstructured memory. And alternative ways, you could say, well, uh, if you're writing a program in a Java or, or Haskell or something like that, then we don't care about memory, we care about objects, uh, which is a legitimate uh, way of doing things. But for simplicity, I'm just going to say uh, we're dealing with memory. So <clears throat> a naive approach is I'm going to associate with every memory location you know, which might be a, a cache, it might be a, a sequence of memory locations, like a cache line, a, a lock and a version number. Uh, I'm going to write version numbers as if they were timestamps, um, just to be suggestive. Uh, in, in practice, uh, they're not uh, timestamps, but we, but we do treat them like timestamps. And associating a lock with every memory location is too many locks. You know, it takes up uh, too much uh, space. So the first thing we're going to do is something called uh, lock uh, striping, where I'm going to take the address and uh, take it mod the number of locks. So I'm going to have uh, one lock that uh, controls a number of uh, unrelated memory locations. And uh, most of the time, uh, this is fine because we don't have too many false uh, conflicts. And you can adjust the size of this, uh, this table. So this is called lock uh, striping for obvious reasons. So <coughs> here we have a, um, the, you know, the memory is initialized with values. Um, every uh, memory location has, is associated with a lock and a, a version number. And so when I do it, run a transaction, I'm going to keep track of the read set. So here, for example, my transaction uh, read location A, and at the time it read that location, it uh, had timestamp 11 o'clock. Uh, same for a B and uh, same for, um, actually there's a typo there. This, th let's pretend that's a D. And so the re we don't acquire any locks for reading. Uh, we simply remember the uh, version number that we saw so that we can detect if something was changed after the fact. Uh, we don't need to lock things because we're not going to modify anything. And so to read memory, we first check that something is unlocked. 
because if somebody has it locked, then it's going to change and there's no point in reading it. And then I'm going to add the address values and version numbers to, to the read set. Now, if I want to write something, then uh, <coughs> the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the addresses, the new values, and the current version number to the write set. So what I'm saying here is that if I commit my transaction, then I'm going to replace C with C plus, with, with C prime, and I'm going to replace E with E prime. So at this point, I have a um, transaction that has uh, read three items and uh, wrote uh, two items. Uh, there's uh, one tricky issue here in that um, I, over, I wrote, overwrote C prime on C. So if I want to read that location, I have to look in my uh, write set before I look in the memory. Because I want to make sure that if I wrote something, I see what I wrote. And there are, there are efficient ways of uh, doing this uh, based on the uh, bloom filters and, and things like that, which I'm not going to discuss, but uh, these things exist. So now I want to commit this transaction. So I'm going to, remember I, I check, I mostly check for synchronization conflicts at commit time. It's not completely true because if I read something and I see it's locked, I'm, not going, I'm going to abort the transaction. But mostly I do, I check at the commit time. So to commit, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to acquire locks for everything in my write set. <coughs> so this says that I'm going to make sure that um, nobody else can uh, modify these things while I'm working on this. So in a traditional lock-based system, you would acquire the lock when you uh, modify something. Here, I'm going to acquire the locks for a very brief window on, during commit. Uh, it's obviously a good idea to acquire locks in canonical order so that you don't deadlock with someone else who's trying to commit at the same time. So you should you know, sort the locks by address and then acquire them in, uh, in that order. Uh, then I'm going to compare version numbers. Because I wasn't holding the locks, someone else could have modified things. So I'm going to check that the version number on each of these items, the, both the ones that I wrote and the ones that I read, are the same as they were when, um, <coughs> when I first read and wrote them. Because I don't want, I'm worried that somebody could have come in and changed things while I wasn't looking. So holding the locks, I check the version numbers. If the version numbers check out, Okay, then I'm going to install the new uh, values into the memory. And then um, increment the version numbers. Incrementing the version numbers guarantees that someone who comes along after me will see that I changed things. And then I release the uh, locks. Now, there are all kinds of optimizations for read-only transactions uh, and uh, so on. But uh, this is the basic work that needs to be done, and everything uh, beyond this is a, is a kind of optimization. Now, there's um, <coughs> there's a lot of mechanical work that you can do to make this uh, runtime mechanism uh, uh, run faster, uh, take up less space, and so on. But there are a number of interesting semantic issues. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the most obvious ones, but there are other issues that uh, I won't have time to talk about. And uh, one of them has to do with, um, we guarantee that every transaction that commits sees a consistent state of the world. Uh, but what about transactions that eventually abort? Uh, do they see a consistent state of the world, or do we care whether they see a consistent state of the world? So that brings up the uh, subject of zombie transactions. So uh, as you may know, a, a zombie is a, um, a reanimated corpse. This, there are a lot of movies about this, uh, these, this sort of thing uh, these days. Uh, but uh, the idea is that uh, you have something that acts like it's alive, but is really dead. So in a system where you check for conflicts at commit, uh, we're worried that a transaction might see an intermediate state left by other transactions that it would never see if it were serializable. 
So a zombie transaction is a one that is, will certainly abort because it will fail the validation at the end. But while it's running, it might see something inconsistent. <clears throat> and the question is, uh, what, who cares? If a transaction is, is certain, certainly going to abort, then it can't do any damage. Well, that's, it turns out that's not actually entirely true. So let's say that I have an application with, that, set, that satisfies an invariant that, say, uh, x is always equal to 2 times uh, y. You know, never mind whether that's a sensible invariant. But so there is this invariant, and what the invariant means is that in between transactions, this always holds. So when a transaction starts, it can guarantee that it knows that this is true, and it makes sure that it, it, it restores the invariant when it leaves. In the middle, inside a transaction, it's allowed to temporarily violate the uh, invariant because no one will ever see this. So here we have a, the red transaction reads x equals 2. A blue transaction wakes up and it, it preserves the invariant. It set, sets x equal to 4 and y equal to 2 and then it commits. So blue has changed the system from one state that satisfies the invariant to another state. Now at this point, red is a zombie. When red tries to commit, the version numbers uh, won't uh, match and it, it is certain to abort. And so far we have uh, no, uh, no problem. So blue commits, it writes the new values to memory. <coughs> now red wakes up and it reads a uh, y and it sees that the y is two. So again, uh, there's um, no problem here because before y commits, it will check the version numbers and everything and it will see that the version number on four has changed so it will abort and not uh, cause any trouble. So, you know, but it's still running even though it hasn't uh, discovered its uh, problem yet. So why do we care about this? Well, now x, or, or the um, transaction decides to uh, divide by x minus y. So the invariant guarantees that x minus y is always non-zero. And so, of course, what happens is uh, you'll get a, a seg fault. And uh, the uh, fact that we've tried to protect, to, to kind of sandbox our software transactional memory isn't going to help because that divide by zero is going to go straight to the operating system. The operating system is going to panic and uh, now your entire uh, computation is going to uh, stop and we don't like it when this happens. So the problem here is that <coughs> if you see a, um, an inconsistent state, then you can do terrible things. Now you might say, okay, so I'm gonna set an interrupt handler so that if you divide by zero inside a transaction, we abort the transaction. But what if that transaction instead uh, does something like, uh, has an infinite loop? You know, what if it, uh, you know, loops on something and, and it runs forever? You say, well, we can put in timer interrupts. Uh, that what if it has a computer to go to and somehow uh, you jump uh, to uh, some uh, code you're not supposed to jump to because you saw an inconsistent state? So basically, once you allow transactions to see inconsistent states, uh, it's very hard to protect against all the terrible things that can happen. And of course, these things will be extremely rare, but you still might have your nuclear reactor explode or something. And so uh, we don't like it uh, when, when this happens. So what we want to do is we want to guarantee a stronger property. Uh, we want to guarantee that every transaction sees a consistent state, even if it's going to abort. And this is called opacity. And in fact, op the notion of opacity was invented by uh, Rashid de Girawi, who gave a talk uh, yesterday. He and his student, he had a student who did a PhD a thesis on this. So uh, this is, uh, you know, Rashid's uh, idea. I'm going to describe a very simple way of uh, doing this. You know, again, <coughs> there are many, many optimizations uh, that uh, people have uh, studied. But I'm going to add a new data structure I'll call a version, a clock. And again, it's not really a timestamp. Uh, it's, um, it's a version number, but it's uh, easier to think about this as a kind of a, a timestamp. And so the timestamp is going to be incremented by some writers. And we're going to use this as a very efficient way of detecting uh, possible uh, um, synchronization conflicts. 
Now, this is conservative in the sense that you might end up aborting transactions that don't need to be aborted. But uh, this typically happens rarely enough that it's, that it's worth um, uh, doing. So it's incremented by some writers, read by everyone, and it guarantees this opacity property that even zombie transactions see a consistent state of the world. <coughs> so the basic idea here is we have a version clock. Again, uh, we're only pretending that these are timestamps, but uh, you know they could be timestamps. So when you start a transaction, you copy the version, uh, the uh, uh, clock value that uh, you saw when you started. And what the transaction does is here the transaction is um, um, running, it has its read set and write set. So we run the speculative transaction pretty much just as uh, before. You know, we, we lock our write set, <coughs> then we increment the global clock. So on commit, we lock the write set, we increment the global clock. Uh, we validate uh, the read set. And then we commit and uh, release uh, the, uh, the locks. For read-only transactions, uh, we do uh, pretty much the same thing, except that uh, all we need to do is check that the variables read are unlocked and that the version numbers are less than or equal to the cached uh, clock. And we, we do this incrementally as we go along, not just at commit, so we can catch uh, any, any inconsistencies. So if we were to lock everything and uh, check everything um, without the version uh, clock, we would have a more precise way of detecting uh, conflicts, but it would be much slower. So here we have a uh, very fast but crude uh, way, which usually works uh, well enough to, uh, to guarantee. It always guarantees opacity, but it's more efficient than a straightforward uh, scheme. Okay, so that's... Um, so, as I mentioned, there are many, many different uh, software transactional memory implementations. Uh, the truth is that uh, not many of these are actually used in practice because they tend to be fairly uh, slow. So, hardware transactional memory is fast but limited in the functionality it can give and it can break in uh, complicated ways. Hybrid transactional memory is probably the most useful because the software layer gives you a way of dealing with the idiosyncrasies of the hardware while still giving you a um, uh, you know, fairly nice uh, performance and a uh, you know, fairly robust uh, interface. Although, as we've seen, there's still some uh, uh, rough edges uh, there. Uh, I think what will happen is that eventually the hybrid and the software transactional memory will kind of emerge that the hardware is really needed to get the performance you want, that software transactional memory systems that are based only on software <coughs> tend to uh, be, um, I think the best ones tend to be something like 50% slower than uh, using uh, locks, which might be perfectly acceptable because it's better software engineering, but really you want five to 10% slower. So uh, making software transactional memory competitive with handcrafted uh, synchronization is still kind of a research uh, challenge. But as hardware transactions become more um, prevalent, as, as they become more common, then the need may be, there, there may, may be less need to make uh, pure software solutions uh, work well. So I'm going to close by uh, talking about a number <coughs> of open research questions. So those of you who are um, looking for research topics, I think there are a lot of interesting uh, things that can be done here. There are certainly some pitfalls you know, there's some areas that uh, seem enticing but are known to be difficult. So uh, before you work in any of those areas, you know, come, you know, talk to, uh, you know, talk to someone to um, check whether this is a sane area or not. Uh, but I think there are a lot of, um, a lot of inter interesting questions. So some of them are implementation choices. So in the software transactional memory, I showed you one particular approach in a very large space of possible approaches. <coughs> the trade-offs are partly understood, but there are still lots of uh, alternative approaches that are not uh, well understood. Uh, an area that uh, really needs uh, work is, is language design. 
So there is, a, for example, a C++ standard that based on transactional memory, which is um, fairly powerful and fairly complicated. It's uh, not terribly uh, elegant, but it's a very uh, functional in the sense that it will do uh, lots of uh, things that, uh, sometimes efficiently and sometimes not. There are semantic issues. You know, what happens under these circumstances? You know, what do you want to happen and how can we make that happen? And there are disputes about the right thing to do under certain uh, circumstances, which I'll, I will uh, uh, discuss. So uh, one issue uh, which I touched on briefly is uh, granularity. <clears throat> so in Java and C++, you want your transactions to work on objects because you don't think about uh, your data as just living in, in memory. In C or C++, objects don't really exist. Objects are, are conventions. Uh, there's nothing to prevent you from adding 27 to a pointer and storing into that uh, location. So, you know, C++ has evolved away from its roots in a C. And so maybe we could ignore this and just say that C++ can join, you know, Java and, and uh, Haskell and other uh, object-oriented languages. You know, that, that's kind of a call. But most of the world's code is still written in C. And so, and C is, you know, memory and not, not objects. So, the choices that you make at runtime for objects and for uh, uh, raw words are going to be a somewhat a different. You know, the, uh, you can count on good behavior in uh, an object-based language. You can't count on anything in a uh, kind of pointer memory-based uh, language. <clears throat> 